So what I would like to do now in the remaining time is to have a closer look into the error treatment for the decay time methods. And once again, after a short introduction, uh, I will introduce the measurement chain uh, where uh, you have different error sources before we then come to applications and a summary. So we have seen in the previous uh, part of that uh, chapter that the decay time method seems to be a relatively robust technique which is more accurate than the ratio method and that it has the potential for low uh, noise, meaning high precision. Uh, it, depending on the phosphor, it can be in the sub percent regime. And so there are roughly maybe 100 phosphors available. Here you see a chart from a publication which dates back something like uh, 20 years. Uh, uh, Allison was among the first uh, providing a very good review if you're interested in this uh, kind of th thermometry. Uh, other reviews have followed, um, among them a, a review by Marcus Aldein's group and from my group as well. Uh, what you see here for different phosphors, uh, the decay time uh, as function of the temperature. And you find here uh, regimes where some phosphors are not sensitive at all, but sensitive in a certain range of temperatures. And uh, from this chart as well, you see you have to know the range of temperatures you're interested in and then select the phosphor appropriately. So we restrict ourselves again to the same phosphor uh, prior to the break, uh, which has this uh, broad range of uh, temperature sensitivity with one branch of low and one branch of high sensitivity. Okay, the spectrum of uh, excitation and emission is shown over here. The excitation in that case has been done somewhere here using a 266 nanometer laser where the absorption is relatively strong. This is normalized. And the emission around 660 nanometers uh, as in the previous part, uh, restricting ourselves to uh, this branch over here. And we just had a discussion about the detector. If you're measuring the decay time, of course, you have to discretize the waveform sufficiently high ideally to have thousands of data points during one decay. And that can be done not only by a CMOS camera, obviously you can use after excitation, here it was the third harmonic, sorry for that. Um, after excitation in the UV, you can do that as well with the photomultiplier tube. Yeah, but then you just have a point-wise uh, uh, measurement, uh, point-wise maybe something like, uh, don't know, 200 by 200 microns or something like that. Yeah, depending on your imaging system, and your excitation here with a pinhole, actually uh, a small area has been selected before it was then imaged on the photomultiplier itself. Maybe one word about that. Why have we used that? The pinhole gives you the spatial resolution, that's one point, but as well what you would like to have is before uh, the photomultiplier, you typically have an interference filter such that all the other radiation is, is not entering that and interference filters are uh, sensitive to the angle that's why, ideally, uh, the light is parallelized before it goes through the filter. That's why it's done that. Uh, with the CMOS camera, as, as shown before, uh, now every pixel behaves like a photomultiplier, and for each pixel, then you observe these waveforms. And um, just a few words about them. Uh, you can obtain, uh, or you can, you can buy cameras that easily go up to megahertz nowadays. The number of pixels is decreasing the higher the rep rate is. Uh, in the high speed uh, chapter, we will have a bit more information about it. Uh, this instrument here, a couple of years old, that had something like 60 by 20 pixels, which were active when operating at 670 kilohertz. But th that's, uh, depending on the phosphor, sufficient to have a good discretization of the decay. So once again, you see here, uh, the uh, calibration, meaning the decay or the linear temperature scale. And uh, you typically do that for different temperatures and then do a polynomial fit to represent as well uh, readings in between. Uh, why is that happening over here? This was done with a photomultiplier tube. And um, to have uh, the highest temporal resolution, you uh, have to terminate, of course, your photomultiplier with 50 ohms to your oscilloscope. Let's say it's a digital uh, scope um, with this opportunity. However, if you uh, terminate that with 50 ohms that you have no reflections, 
then your overall intensity is rather low. That's why uh, you might choose a different termination, like with 500 ohms, but then you lose the uh, uh, temporal resolution at very short decay times. That's why this leveling out is really dependent on the resistance you use. If you would use 100 ohms on the expanse of the signal, you, would, could, f you could follow that trace with this digital oscilloscope even further. But we have been interested only in temperatures up to 850 Kelvin or something like that. And then uh, even with the photomultiplier, which is a very good instrument and preferred if you're interested only in point-wise information, don't use the much uh, ex more expensive CMOS, then you achieve as well uh, in the high temperature range with the high sensitivity, you achieve a sub um, percent uh, precision, meaning here in, in, in absolute values, something like a precision of uh, half a Kelvin. That's really good, half a Kelvin. Okay, but we have to uh, have a closer look into the error sources and why we can obtain uh, these, these good, uh, these high precisions. So a measurement chain gives you an idea what actually happens. Uh, now in our case, uh, temperature of a surface up to uh, the measured value. And so I have, I have divided that into the actual measurement on the left and the calibration to the right. And uh, there, most of the measurement chain is identical, but there are some differences, of course, to be discussed. So first of all, you do have here the temperature during the calibration of your calibration environment. Uh, in the actual measurement, that will be the measurement itself. So a surface, for example, of your co um, combustor. Um, then, uh, due to heat transfer, uh, the um, phosphor that is coated on this uh, surface will change uh, its temperature, uh, both in the calibration and in the actual measurement. Then, due to the pho phosphor uh, photophysics, the luminescence properties, the decay time, will change in the calibration and in the actual measurement. This decay time will be detected uh, with certain limitations from your detection device. Maybe uh, your response time is, is limited, your resolution and time is limited, so there will come some restrictions. And then based on the algorithm, based on something like a mono exponential decay that we assume, you end up in both cases with a scalar value, whereas in the cal calibration, this scalar value is then compared to a thermometer that has been uh, attached to the uh, surface uh, where you want to measure the temperature. So you do have now a correspondence between decay time, a scalar value, and the temperature. And uh, this is uh, our calibration, which is then used in the actual measurement as comparison to come up with the uh, temperature reading. And so now we can subdivide this measurement chain into different error classes from one to six. And we go through these error classes, not in all detail, but to give you an idea what could happen. So the first is the heat transfer. So the device under test, DUT, um, maybe this uh, problem is that the phosphor coating uh, and uh, the calibration thermometer are not in thermal equilibrium. In principle, uh, that can happen or the phosphor um, uh, and, the, and the substrate itself is not in thermal equilibrium. That is uh, happening, for example, if you have strong temporal variations. Um, if you have a phosphor made out of ceramics, even if you have only, let's say, 10 microns thin coating, that acts as heat insulation. And so I already mentioned that, in that sense, it's not a non-intrusive method, you have a certain invasion by that, and I call it semi-invasive. And, invasive. and that comes into play again if you have a fast uh, change of your surface temperatures. Then uh, you have an impact on that. Um, there's another impact that comes from the fact that uh, uh, you might heat your phosphor due to the laser pulse. Yeah? You shoot maybe a millijoule on a certain area, uh, against that phosphor and partly that will be absorbed and this absorption uh, will of course do your electronic excitation from which the phosphorus sense takes place but uh, a part of that of course will, the larger, la larger part will be uh, heating up uh, the phosphor itself and that can be looked at in a power scan. 
and that should be done in a power scan. And in the application example, especially for high speed um, thermometry, I will show uh, the impact. And it can easily be a couple of Kelvin. Okay, so the next error classes here are devoted to the photophysics. So first of all, we have seen that uh, this phosphor we're looking at uh, does have different ranges of sensitivity. Just as a reminder, um, what we have had that was here a nonlinear scale of uh, the uh, decay, decay time tau over the temperature, which was linear, and there we have had these two areas. So the sensitivity is for lower temperatures for this phosphor lower than for higher temperatures. Uh, as well, um, the, the system does have a, a certain thermal inertia, meaning that uh, your phosphor coating has a certain temporal low pass filter characteristics. Yeah? And as well, you do have a certain decay time, and the decay time is as well a certain threshold uh, acting as a, as, a, as a low pass filter. If you have a temperature change which is faster than the decay time, then you're in trouble. You do have other parameters that manipulate the transfer function of your phosphor. For example, uh, there might be, especially if you have a, a stainless steel substrate, yeah, um, there might be at high temperatures diffusion processes taking place between your phosphor and the substrate. We're talking about 1000 Kelvin or something like that. And that means that maybe partly ions from uh, the, the stainless steel material are diffusing into the phosphor or the other way around. Or uh, your phosphor is as well prone to oxygen quenching. Some phosphors are, are, have a cross sensitivity and you have to be aware of that. Um, and uh, the laser excitation makes a difference. So the uh, changing intensity makes a difference in such a sense. Here you see that for uh, a certain uh, measurement area, I forgot which, which, which um, area that was, that was con kept constant, but the energy was, was changed from 50 to 500 microjoules. And for the phosphor we're currently looking at, you see here after normalization uh, that uh, the decay, overall it's, it's not mono exponential. So in the beginning you have maybe some fluorescence making it uh, a steeper decay, but you see differences between the decayed curve. And that means um, your, your uh, calibration uh, is as well sensitive to that parameter. And it's not over sensitive, it's not huge the impact, but at least the range of um, energy per, per area should be kept constant between calibration and the actual measurement. And of course you have to select a certain range where you do your uh, evaluation. I'll come to that in a second. So uh, more generally spoken for this phosphor, you see that the decay behavior seems to be more multi-exponential if you have higher laser intensities shown in this black line. <coughs> and you have a significant influence now where you do your, measure, uh, your, your fitting. So if you would uh, <coughs> fit your mono exponential maybe in this range, it is less sensitive compared to do the fitting, let's say, in uh, this range over here. So we have to come up with a pragmatic way to overcome that. It comes in a second. Before that, sensitivity with regard to diffusion processes with the substrate. So here, uh, on the left-hand side, you see uh, the phosphor has been coated uh, by airbrush methods uh, to stainless steel. And then this sample has been treated uh, by heat. It has been heated up uh, to over 1000 Kelvin for a certain time. Then it was cooled down. And again, for room temperature, uh, the decay time has been measured. So the decay time has been measured and after treatment of he by heat, up to something like a thousand Kelvin, nothing happened, so nothing shown in between. For higher temperatures, uh, for, error, uh, for, for heat treatments, a couple of minutes or so, uh, you see that the decay time is changing drastically. So that means there must have been taking place some um, diffusion processes, that's my speculation, with the substrate material. And that depends on the duration and uh, the maximum temperature that sample has seen. It's not the, uh, um, phosphor itself, because if you do the same without the substrate, the pure powder, you can heat it up and for this phosphor up to 1200K, nothing happened. Eventually, if you would go to 2000K, for sure, something will happen. Yeah, it depends on the phosphor. 
There are other phosphors which degrade much earlier, but this phosphor is uh, okay even up to 1200K. So that is not easy. Yeah? How to account for if you uh, do that uh, experiment uh, now in a combustion chamber where you do have uh, metal surfaces? It has to be kept into mind. The surrounding gas phase can have an impact. So for this phosphor uh, that has been checked, uh, the phosphor uh, was, was exposed in the oven, but in the oven there has been as well a cell, and this cell could be uh, flooded with different gases, air, oxygen, nitrogen, and you see independent of that, the calibration curves, they superimpose more or less perfectly. As well, the pressure has been changed, it was insensitive, as well as uh, CH4 has been added, um, uh, as well as, as water vapor. And so all of these gave uh, the same decay characteristics. So this phosphor is really insensitive against the surrounding gas phase. If you take another phosphor, this is one where you have yttrium oxide, which is doped with europium. Uh, there you see with an increasing oxygen, oxygen concentration given over here uh, that the decay time changes. Uh, and the decay time for a given temperature uh, as well depends on the oxygen concentration. So we have uh, looked into more detail here. It's not published, but in principle, uh, I can, of course, you can, you can use that cross sensitivity now as well, not only to measure temperatures, but as well makes, measure oxygen concentrations. You, you would use a phosphor like that, which is insensitive to get the temperature, and then use a second phosphor, and with knowing temperature, measuring the de decay time of that guy, you would uh, then uh, uh, would be able to measure oxygen concentrations and small variations of them. Something like an optical lambda sensor you can think of. Yeah? It has to be proven that it's useful. Okay, signal detection. What is uh, happening over here? So maybe you will have a limited temporal re resolution. That will have, have an impact. Um, uh, similarly, with the spatial resolution, in, in terms, if you have now, uh, let's say, your spot monitored by the uh, photo multiplier is relatively large, and in between you have variations of the surface temperature that will, of course, impose a, yeah, an error which is, which is uh, uh, yeah, dependent on your, on your spatial resolution. Um, you would, in, in some cases, you, you observe a nonlinearity of your detector. CMOS cameras, if you now make uh, temperature maps of your surface, are prone to that. Or you have a small change in the alignment. We have seen that for the lifetime method, it's not as bad as for the uh, ratio method, but in principle there as well, we have seen slight variations that impact that. Or uh, you have uh, a change in the terminating resistor um, that makes a change in your um, temporal response of your photomultiplier. Uh, or you use uh, an amplifier in, 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 uh, in front of your uh, CMOS that will as well impact your resolution properties and uh, thereby influence the decay time. You might end up with optical or electrical interferences. So for example, background radiation. It might happen that your filter in front of the detector is not narrow enough such that there is background radiation as well contributing or chemiluminescence. That could happen. And that uh, typically would be maybe correlated uh, to what you measure in your decay and would uh, make your position worse. Or you might have electrical interferences. So especially using older YAG lasers, they come along with uh, electromagnetic noise. And if you have a BNC cable that acts as an antenna, you can see as well, uh, more or less in the beginning of your decay time, as well as some, some spikes that are not due to the phosphor, but simply due to this um, uh, interferences from uh, this electrical noise. Or you might have uh, a system where you have moving surfaces, like a, an example will come, like an uh, intake or exhaust valve. And then uh, maybe uh, during the decay, you're measuring different parts of the, uh, of the surface. And that might as well um, uh, come along with the spatial variation, uh, not only of the temperature, but as well maybe your phosphor coating is differently thick, and that might as well impact um, your, your uh, uh, error. 
And so that, that should be now uh, detailed in, in some more detail. Um, we compare here, uh, our photomultipliers typically are not so problematic in terms of uh, their, their nonlinearity, but CMOS cameras actually they are uh, nonlinear. Their pixel to pixel homogeneity is not very good, and as well the offset stability is limited. And so maybe some, some I'm giving some uh, more data about that. What you see here is the response of a CMOS in terms of the counts, the gray values, uh, between zero, and in this case it was a 12-bit system, a bit more than 4,000 counts. And here you see uh, the intensity that has been put on this CMOS camera, and this was a homogeneous light source. We call that an Ulbricht sphere that is, uh, um, yeah, well, built such that you have a certain area from which you have a homogeneous light distribution with a known spectrum and a known intensity. And um, so we know uh, the watt per square meter that comes out, and uh, the CMOS camera, depending on the pixel, have a nonlinear behavior. So the dashed line would be the linear behavior, and for higher intensities, you have a deviation which is in the percent regime. And so now it depends on how strong your decay signal actually is. In the beginning, maybe you have something like three and a half thousand counts, and during the decay, it goes down to zero, and then you have superimposed these characteristics. That as well impacts your measurement. Um, the CMOS cameras are not homogeneous, so you have to come up with a correction function for each pixel that can be done and should be done. Of course, you have then a million pixels, so you need a million calibration curves. So maybe you end up with a data handling problem, but in principle, it's doable. And <coughs> if you do that properly, and use the PMT as a benchmark, then uh, you see that the calibration curve can be uh, matched by the CMOS camera quite nicely, as well as the temporal standard deviation. Of course, the spatial standard deviation cannot be achieved by the, by the photomultiplier. So in, if you do that correctly, as I said, with some effort, uh, the CMOS camera, despite its um, limitations uh, in homogeneity and nonlinearity, can be compensated for. Your uh, coding thickness might vary. That might happen if you have a moving device or maybe between calibration and the actual measurement you had to uh, renew your coding and the coding process is a very critical thing. It, might, it will never be uh, perfect and uh, you will never be able to repeat uh, the layer thickness perfectly such that here by intention we have uh, increased the thickness and then evaluated the data at different locations where we know the thickness and then uh, for homogeneous temperatures, you end up with different outcomes, uh, with different mean and different variances, seeing as well that the thicker the coating, the better the precision, and the thicker the coating, the more the insulation. So it's up to you what you do. You have to find a compromise, like always. Yeah? It's a trade-off. Um, but I would say still the influence is limited. Um, discretization is a problem. Um, with a uh, CMOS camera, maybe, uh, as I said, the number of active pixels is limited. If you increase the rep rate and have a better discretization, more samples for the decay time to be measured, uh, then you have uh, less dynamic range in space. And that's why maybe you come up with only seven samples to measure the decay. And not a good choice. Yeah? You see here the precision uncertainty, one sigma standard deviation is huge. Do it with 70 values is still not very good, uh, but uh, it, it reduces uh, remarkably. Ideally, uh, taking uh, much higher frame rates, much more samples to discretize um, the decay. So you see, uh, it is less a problem of accuracy, it is more a problem of precision. Okay. Let's have a look into. Uh, other parameters impacting the transfer function. Back to the photomultiplier tube. Uh, if you do not decide to measure uh, with 50 ohms termination, uh, but for higher signals, maybe take 500 ohms, uh, you end up with a limited decay time that you can resolve, and then it levels out. So this um, really depends on uh, this terminating resistor. And of course, between uh, calibration and actual measurement, you cannot change that. You must keep it as it is. About the algorithm, 
Um, what you do is, and I think in your printout, at least in mine, I received this was a black box. Um, uh, what you actually should see is, uh, I think this was tracing back to your question, um, that you have a decay which is not mono-exponential all over the place. Here in the beginning, it's for sure multi-exponential. Later on, I can't tell you, uh, that is uh, here noise, and here uh, that is due to the flattening, due to the terminating resistor in that case. So what you want to do is you want to select a certain range in time where your model function, your exponential decay, is uh, reasonably uh, justified. And so doing that in this range over here seems to be okay. So maybe one way to do that is to fix the interval, the window where you do this uh, fitting. If you do this with a predefined fitting, let's say you start at, at a certain uh, time zero to be defined by your laser, and then your, your left um, uh, corner of your fitting window, T1, is uh, a, a certain constant that you have chosen times delta T that you brings you to that point, and then you have a fitting window up to T2, which is uh, here uh, another constant C2 times delta T, this part. If you would do it like that, you would end up with a calibration curve, uh, which is, which is uh, in the end, uh, looking like that. Not very good. So where you as well uh, have here these jumps where you maybe have changed as well your uh, um, uh, settings of the oscilloscope. If you do this iteratively, the difference here is only that still you select C1 and C2 as predefined parameters, but the delta T is not fixed. The delta T is replaced by the decay time itself. And thereby, depending on the decay time, depending on the temperature, your window actually is shifting. And by that, uh, you see that directly on the curve, you get a much smoother curve. And that's a way uh, that turned out uh, to be better than using a predefined window, using an adaptive window where the adaptation comes from this uh, decay time. Still, you pre-select C1 and C2, and uh, we have done that then empirically using those constants that we are sufficiently far from the area where you have obviously uh, uh, multi-exponential decay, uh, but you, would not, you wouldn't like to put that too far right because then you lose the high signal intensity. Yeah? So you must find a compromise between sufficiently mono-exponential and um, uh, sufficiently high signal, and then you extend that up to the point where you think that the, sh that the noise shoots in. And that's why I recommend to vary C1 and C2 uh, for known and constant conditions and look for the precision. Yeah? And with that, uh, it seems to work. As well, we have a published a paper where we compared different ways to do the uh, exponential as well as mono-exponential fit, but you know, mono-exponential fit is, no, is, is, is never good. And so if you have a phosphor that decays uh, where you have no area in time where you can fit a mono-exponential curve, that's not a good phosphor. I would look for a different one, and there are different ones. Okay. And finally, uh, have a look at the thermometer. Um, uh, first of all, in areas where you have a more or less uh, linear behavior in this representation, uh, of course, you would not need as many points as shown over here, but where you have a strong curvature, of course, you need many samples. And that means your calibration oven should be operated with a, with a small temperature changes, and that can take a long time. And so the way we do that is we heat up the oven which has a huge uh, thermal inertia, and then uh, we turn it off, and then uh, you, you, the, the cooling down takes hours, and during that cooling down, we take um, the calibration, and uh, calibration measurements take maybe per temperature something like, I forgot that, maybe two minutes or so, and during that time, the temperature has changed only by less than uh, a tenth of a Kelvin, and that's okay, yeah. Okay. And then finally, the thermometer. Uh, and that is done here, in our case, with a the thermocouple. You can get them with a good accuracy in the order of sub-percent. Uh, but you have to, of course, make sure that everything is in uh, uh, equilibrium in your oven. So use a large oven is better than a small one, where you can assume that everything 
why radiation is in uh, equilibrium. And then we can come up with uh, uh, something like a yeah, estimation of the different um, errors that might be associated with the different error classes. So actually the first one with the heat transfer, that's difficult to estimate. I have no, let's say, clear value for you here. In terms of excitation, if you do it wrong, it can be in the order of up to 10 Kelvin. We haven't discussed the dopant concentration. If that is varying, let's say you have done a calibration with one phosphor or doing the actual measurement with another phosphor with different dopant concentration, it can be much worse. Yeah, it can be in the order of, of uh, more than 10 Kelvin. The heat treatment we have seen is in the order of 10 Kelvin. The surrounding gas phase can make a change up to 100 Kelvin, depending on the phosphor. Uh, the detection system as well can impact in the order of 100 Kelvin uh, in accuracy. The algorithm for data reduction as well, impact of 10 Kelvin. Calibration, uh, same order of magnitude. Accuracy of the calibration thermocouple may be in the order of 10 Kelvin. So all of these sources may happen and you have to treat that properly such that in the end, you're able to reduce the systematic error of below 1%. Uh, but that needs to be done very, very, very carefully. And uh, the intention of that is, although this is a robust technique, in each of that steps, uh, you have to be very thorough to reach uh, these uh, good results. In terms of statistical error, uh, well, you can achieve something we have uh, even below a Kelvin, but being a, a bit more conservative, I would say one to two Kelvin is achievable. Compare that to the gas phase, this is much better here. In the gas phase thermometry, uh, I would be really glad to have a technique that allows us to measure with the two Kelvin precision at 1000 K. So to my knowledge, that doesn't exist. So we still have 10 minutes to go. Um, so a few application examples. Maybe I skip that one that is uh, maybe less interesting. Let's directly go to the optical engine. Here I would like to demonstrate how to select a phosphor. Uh, again, you see a chart of different choices. Um, uh, in our um, uh, review paper, uh, this was published in, in PEX in 2013 or 14, I forgot. Uh, there we have listed all phosphors we could find in the literature by the time it was close to 100. So here it's only a small uh, part of them shown. And so if you do it uh, now in engine research, uh, first of all, your phosphor decay should not be last too long because it's an intermittent process and the surface temperature in your cylinder might change. That's why we say uh, it should not last longer than 10 to the minus four seconds. Then we want to do a 2D measurement using a CMOS camera. And I've shown you that the temporal discretization is important. And because these cameras come along with a certain uh, frame rate, uh, the phosphor should not decay faster, let's say, than uh, uh, two microseconds or so. Then we know that the surface temperatures of your engine are somewhere between, uh, let's say, 350K and 700K. And then you look at what is left over and you find here one phosphor that seems to be okay. This is a phosphor, uh, we call that simply GGG phosphor, um, doped with chromium and eventually as well a bit of cere uh, that helps to um, uh, make the decay, uh, the afterglow uh, to be reduced. Uh, okay, with that window, we do have now an instrument that allows us to measure in a plane, a field, and a suitable phosphor. And what I want to show here is an example where the outlet valve of an engine that was in cooperation with our colleagues in Duisburg was uh, coated. And uh, you see here a YAG laser that was operated at 10 hertz, so eventually only one um, temperature field per cycle. And a, a, C a CMOS camera operated here at 360 kilohertz, observing the phosphorescence of this phosphor. With the spatial resolution rather good, something like 200 microns per pixel, and overall uh, 60 by 60 pixels, which is restricted by the frame rate of that camera. And here you see the view from uh, uh, the, the um, piston, the exhaust valves, the intake valves, and one of these was coated, and that was uh, close to production type valve. Uh, that has been used over here. And the field of view was then a part of this coated valve. And here you see now uh, the results. This is uh, for different crank angles uh, that has been averaged over 10 exposures. 
uh, the color is giving rise to the temperature uh, and uh, these rectangles over here, these are areas where have, we have binned, we have averaged the information giving to the right hand side. And so maybe I can go through that again. Uh, now we are in the intake, rather uh, low temperatures uh, with the averages over here. Uh, that was the intake stroke. Then uh, during the compression stroke, the temperatures rise at the edge of the valve, higher temperatures, because of course uh, at the center you have better heat conduction. That's why you have a certain temperature gradient in the order of here uh, 40 Kelvin. Then uh, somewhere here there was ignition and uh, after some delay, shortly after top dead center, the flame has propagated and touched the exhaust valve. That is where, where you have now the highest temperatures, heating rates that can be enormously, uh, but the absolute temperature has changed maybe only by 40, 50 K. And then uh, you have the expansion stroke. And then for this engine conditions, something strange happens. Here at the outer part, the temperature drops. Anyone with an idea why that happens? Yes? Yes, you open the, ex uh, the exhaust valve and for this engine uh, condition, actually uh, gases from the exhaust sweeps back into the cylinder. Uh, you have a certain exhaust gas coming back into the cylinder and that is colder than uh, the charge into the cylinder and that's why you have, at least in the outer parts here, a cooling. Okay, so that is uh, helpful, especially for um, uh, engine manufacturers, so we have transferred that uh, methodology into, into the car industry because uh, they, they use it now uh, to uh, look for their cylinder heads. When you, uh, when you make downsizing, of course, the power density is, is increasing and the problem is cooling for all operation conditions. The cylinder heads, if you have a Porsche engine, I don't know, with 600 horsepower and six cylinders or so, it's huge and the problem is cooling. And uh, uh, doing that only based on calculations seemed not to be sufficient. And so they uh, use now these techniques um, to uh, look into uh, surface temperatures of the cylinder head. We can extend that as well um, for higher rep rates. So what I've shown was only 10 hertz, and that's my last example for today, um, such that you can here over the crank angle get the uh, mean wall temperatures with a certain standard deviation due to cyclic variations and only to a small degree due to the imprecision. But you can do it well at high speed. Why not using a high repetition rate laser uh, and resolve temperatures within a cycle? That can be done. For that, you need a fast decaying phosphor because if you now operate your engine maybe at a thousand RPM and you want to measure every crank angle, the surface temperature, then you have only 160 microseconds in between two excitations. And in between, of course, the phosphor must have decayed completely. So you need a fast decaying phosphor. That's why uh, for that motor engine we have used this candidate where the decay time, depending on the temperature, is uh, between something like 10 microseconds and a fraction of a microsecond. Uh, that has been optimized in the setup here up to 400 Kelvin because this was a motored engine that would not be sufficient for a fired engine. Okay, a proof of principle more. Uh, now we come to another error class we have discussed, laser induced heating. Because you operate now your laser with six kilohertz or so, although it might contain only one millijoule, uh, you find a heating. The temperature uh, of your device is dependent uh, on the energy that is contained in each pulse. Yeah, this is here uh, a tenth of a millijoule or a hundredth of a millijoule. It's not very much, but still I, I forgot again the area that has been illuminated. It was maybe, I don't know, something like uh, a couple of square millimeters. In the paper you would find that. And then uh, of course there's a trade-off. If you take very small energies, your signal is bad and your noise is larger. And that's why you need to find a compromise between noise, sufficiently small error bar here, and uh, a heating which is causing systematic errors which are not as bad. So here uh, it was chosen with two and a half Kelvin. Okay, after that um, I would like to uh, show you the realization of that, where now we have done that uh, for the motored engine 
replacing the spark plug by a dummy uh, and using a photomultiplier tube, a high-speed UV laser at six kilohertz. You see here the coated area. So this is so much easier to coat if you don't have a full cylinder head, but just a small place that you can uh, uh, easily coat without having the, the full cylinder head in place. Uh, again, by, by spray coating, uh, yeah, well, with the engine parameters here listed, and then you find it's not very exciting, actually, but um, the temperature over the crank angle, intake, compression, expansion, exhaust, and there you see how the temperature changes. Uh, and, and the mean values are shown over here for a number of cycles, and here you see the variation, which is actually only plus minus 2K. It's not very much, yeah, as expected for a motored engine. It will become more exciting if you go now to a, a fired engine, but that is something we have to leave for tomorrow. Uh, some recent uh, experiments which are now actually published, that's not in your lecture loads you now because the publication happened uh, two weeks ago or something like that. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, and uh, we will meet outside for uh, the photograph and I guess the questions you have either sent to me by email or at the poster session, which I will join after lunch or uh, tomorrow uh, during the next uh, set of courses. Thank you very much.